Hello, friends. Welcome to the Nexus Podcast. I'm your host, James Dice. Each week, I fire questions at the leaders of the smart buildings industry to try to figure out where we're headed and how we can get there faster without all the marketing fluff. I'm pushing my learning to the limit, and I'm so glad to have you here following along. This episode is a conversation with Rags Gupta, president of occupancy counting startup Butler.io. We walk through Rags' fascinating career path through many different types of entrepreneurship and eventually into the buildings world to hang out with us. Then we dove deep into Butler's approach to occupancy data, how they're different, why they take an API-first approach, and the trends they're seeing in the market today. So without further ado, please enjoy the Nexus podcast with Rags Gupta. Hello, Rags. Welcome to the show. Can you introduce yourself for us? James, great to be here. Uh, Rags Gupta. I'm the president of Butler.io. Awesome. And we're going to unpack what that means. I'd love to hear uh, a little bit more about your background before we jump into Butler, though. Obviously, Butler is a smart buildings technology, and most of your background is from outside of the industry. In fact, you and I met when you were just kind of getting into the industry and you were like, let me ask you some questions about how this thing works. <laughs> well, let's start with your present role. So I was looking at your LinkedIn and it was yeah. like the world's record for most present roles <laughs> on LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. So what are all the things that you're up to besides, yeah. uh, besides Butler? Yeah, so, so I would say like the, the overall theme for me is, is I love partnering with fellow entrepreneurs to help them achieve their mission. And so that can take different forms from being an advisor or a passive investor as a, you know, like an angel investor, all the way to getting, you know, full-time getting involved and, you know, into the business. Right. So, you know, a little bit more background. I've been in tech since uh, late, you know, since 1999, so a little over 20 years, cut my teeth during the dot-com boom and, and bust and, and having been through that, that was, you know, sort of everything else seems like a cakewalk, frankly. Uh, it was just like this nuclear winner, which, you know, have a lot of scar tissue around, but, but it was, it was formative, but yeah, anyway, I, I spent the first part of my career in the early days of the web and, and the internet and right when commerce was starting to happen and subscription models and, and, and so on. And then after that was at the early days of, of SaaS and cloud-based uh, applications. So I was part of the early team at a company actually here in Boston called Bright Cove, which was um, a pioneer in online video distribution. So sort of like a B2B version of YouTube. And uh, we, we ended up taking that public seven years later. And, and, and by then I'd uh, kind of moved on, did a startup that we ended up shutting down and then was a board member of one of Bright Coast partner companies, which in, in um, ad tech in, in video ad, ad distribution and hopped there, hopped in there full time, worked with the entrepreneur and we, we grew it. We sold it later, uh, two years later to Telstra. And so anyway, just long story short, I've been sort of doing this thing for a while in, in, a, in a multitude of industries. After that, I moved back to Boston and was in this indoor positioning um, startup out of the MIT ecosystem called Humatics. So very high precision positioning systems, you know, really deep tech and, and, you know, helping, you know, figure out the product market fit for the technology and, and okay. then growing that uh, since. And so kind of to tie the thread back to Butler, that's really where I, I, my eyes were open to sort of this, this world of sensors and connected sensors and positioning systems. And, and so when I got introduced to Butler, it, you know, immediately sort of resonated kind of what they were doing and the possibility and that vision really resonated for me. Got it. Okay. Can you talk about just a little bit of the sort of early motivations for getting into entrepreneurship? Yeah. I had a, a college professor at, at my senior year in college who taught this course called High Tech Entrepreneurship, which this is 1998 when it was not a thing. It was just... It, you know, it, it was, it was, it was totally, you know, was, you know, no one would have told you what a startup, what meant. Yeah. And he really opened my eyes to this other career path besides banking and consulting and some of those other companies that were recording on campus. And it sounds crazy at the time, but you know, we had put together this, this senior project and it, it was for essentially reverse IP lookup to provide geographical information of website visitors. 
And okay. he offered to help us. We weren't prepared for that as a, as a team. And, and, and it sounds kind of crazy because now that's what kind of what teams do these days. And it, it, you know, I do a lot of work with MIT uh, students and they're always looking at forming companies, but back then it was sort of crazy. And so <laughs> we didn't do it. it. It's, it sounds silly, but I was too risk averse at the time to like, go okay. do it, right. As a, whatever, 22 year old, but it opened my eyes and, 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 and to this world. And so I, I ended up joining a management consulting company and within nine months realized it was not the place for me. I really liked building things and kind of operating and just having that ownership. Mm-hmm. And, and so uh, I left and pretty much took one of the first things that came my way, which is essentially this chief of staff role at this, at this startup in, in, in Silicon Valley. And so, and, and since then it's just the, 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 I just love taking things and building and scaling them and trying to find new ways of doing things and and providing value and so there's there's always the ups and downs you know that's what you know that that's what startup life is all about but it is you know wouldn't have it any other way very cool yeah it reminds me of you know i haven't started a bunch of companies just just this one but it reminds me of my early experience i took i had one elective in college so i went to a jesuit university and studied engineering so engineering, there's not much electives. And then the Jesuits kind of take it and they make it sure that you, they, they decide what you spend your electives yeah. on basically. <laughs> so yeah. I had one course. And so I, I had took an entrepreneurship course. And one of the things that I did was partnered or volunteered, I guess is a better term for mm-hmm. this two person solar startup. So this was in 2008. Solar was just kind of taken off in the US. And I, I basically for like eight weeks, just cold called people. (laughs) And I feel like whenever I, you know, my first 10 years of my career, kind of like you just said, with the management consulting, it just like wasn't totally a fit because it wasn't building. It wasn't creating something from scratch. So kindred spirits, I guess. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's, and, you know, it's not to say you can't do that within a larger company. In fact, I think companies have gotten a lot more entrepreneurial in the mm-hmm. last couple of decades, you know, I, I tell people, gosh, like we have, we have big companies coming to us, wanting to work with us. And like, with, uh, with like, you know, offering up meetings with senior people, like, like this was not, you know, you were lucky to get a response from a junior person in yeah. the early two thousands from anybody you pitched. Right. So mm-hmm. it, it's great that way. I think companies have recognized it. And the question is like, how do you best set yourself up to, to do that? And sometimes it's buying companies as partnering with them or, or starting your own, but that's the, you know, that's the way of the world now. It's just, it's innovation and leveraging technology. And, and that's not, you know, it's only accelerating. Totally. So speaking of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, you released a book in the fall, uh, one to 10. We'll put a link in the show notes. I, I'd love to hear a little bit about what the book's about and what, why, you, why you wrote it. Yeah, 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 it, it is. It, you know, here's, the, uh, here's that prop I mentioned. So it was a pandemic project of mine. I found myself with some free time and I always wanted to write. And I, I used to write a lot back when kind of blogging first came out. And, and like I said, I've been working with entrepreneurs as an advisor and, and board member and whatever it was. And what I tried to do was actually distill a lot of those learnings you know, into things that could be kind of more easily shared or digested, right? And, and, and so it was sort of a way to scale myself. And, and as I went about it, I kind of realized that there was, there was sort of a thesis forming and, and, and the formings of a book. And so I went with it. So the core thesis is, and, and it kind of ties to what we just talked about, which is that it's actually easier than ever to get from zero to one. And I define that as, you know, starting with nothing and creating something, some version of a product, getting some funding, getting a few team members, getting some, you know, pilot customers, right? It, like I said, companies are leaning into innovation. They're going to fund pilot projects, right? You have platforms and platforms on top of platforms, like right? the AWSs yeah. and Snowflakes, and you can get $100,000 of free AWS credits without really trying, right? You yeah. know, and, and it goes on from there, right? You, you, so it's just so much easier now to get that first something out there, right? And yet it's harder than ever uh, to get what I call from one to 10. And that can mean one to $10 million in ARR in terms of revenue. For harder tech companies, it can mean one to 10 deployments. And, and really it's this like proxy for this phase 
it's like the kind of adolescent phase of a startup where it's like, you're kind of growing up, you're maturing. It's no longer just like throwing a bunch of bodies at something. You got to have process. You got to have, mm-hmm. uh, and so you know, there's, there's a lot of like growing pains that you go through in that journey. And, and I break it down into like three legs of the stool that you need to have to be able to get from one to 10 and then beyond. So the first is product readiness, where um, do you have something that can go from pilot to production that's being used and, and actually can be stamped out at scale, right? Not at massive scale, maybe, but you're not like handcrafting every single one and then sort of like babysitting it every single, all the time, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're actually, it sort of, it works, right? That's like the yeah. first. There's a lot more to unpack behind that, but that's like product readiness, right? The okay. second is repeatable sales uh, and specifically non-founder sales, right? So in general, you know, as a founder, you're selling the vision, the dream, right? People are buying into it, the early adopters. In this like next phase, it's like, can you have people you hire? And then eventually, can you have people you hire who they themselves hire people to sell mm-hmm. this, right? And it's no longer the vision. It's it's around value. It's around ROI. It can be whatever, whatever your pitch is, right? It's, it's But it's different than like the founder sell. Yeah. Um, and then obviously there's like unit economics that goes around that. And then the third is, is really, can you scale your human capital, uh, which is like, so, so org design, can you come up with a cadence to run your company in terms of having accountability and autonomy? Can you keep your culture? Can you hire the right people? Can you, and, and fundamentally as a founder, can you figure out the roles of your co-founders and yourself and, and scale yourselves ultimately? Because again, like, you know, I work with some, you know, I've mentored some earlier stage teams and. It's all great right when you start out, but then sometimes the most, most, you know, most of what happens is with, with, with founding teams, they'll have one person that's like the CEO, right? And then the other, the co-founders then to find other roles, right? That also are like leverage their superpowers and, and are great for the company. Mm-hmm. But sometimes that's not necessarily understood upfront and that can lead to churn and friction and tension and, and all that, right? And so... Again, founder transitions happen all the time. They're really natural. But what I try and say, tell people is like, have those conversations. It's like a relationship. Have the conversations up front and, and on a regular basis. Because mm-hmm. if not, and if you keep pushing it off, then, then it's going to just be awkward at, at, at best. And, and it can be value destroying at worst. And, and, and you know, no one wants, you know, wants to have that. So anyway, I kind of pull it all together. And then just to like finish the thesis, you know, I argued like if you can get to 10, it's that much easier to get to hundred or wherever you get to. Right. It right. uh, doesn't mean it's easy, but you've built the muscle to delegate, to, you know, have a cadence you've built them, you know, you've started to build a lot of muscle to mature. And so, you know, that was uh, you know part of sort of the, the journey. And I just work with a lot of startups in that phase. And so it was very resonant for me to, to, you know, do some writing around it. Cool. Oh well, yeah. I'll put the link in the show notes. I, I haven't, Checked it out yet? But it's in my it's in my Amazon cart, which is where oh, all cool. my, well, my yeah, I'll get your copy of one too. Yeah, sweet. All right, sounds good. All right, so you wrote you're writing the book last year, I'm presuming, and at some point you jumped in with Butler. I'd love to hear how, how you got involved with them and kind of what the founding story of the company is. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually writing a lot of the book in in 2020 during the pandemic, you know, during like the first bits of the pandemic, and. Late 2020, I got introduced to Butler through one or one of Butler's VCs, um, okay. who I'd known actually my last company, Humatics. And so, given my kind of background in indoor positioning and and spatial intelligence, he said, "Hey, Rags, I'd love to like you know meet the founder. Get, let me know what you think." Mm-hmm. And so I did, and I immediately hit it off with the founder, and was and 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 I started working with him as an advisor. And as I got to know him and the business more, the technology more, I got more excited about it. As a little bit of an aside, indoor positioning has been, you know, has has both held a lot of promise, but it's also had a lot of disappointment along the way. Because inevitably, there's there's always some kind of gotcha in terms of scaling. So it could be cost, it could be the amount of infrastructure you need, it could be having to have a symmetric system where there's a wearable on someone. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's not ideal for certain situations. It could be accuracy. There's sort of always some part of that equation that might be kind of thrown off, right? And and it, it just limits the market then for that technology, right? So, okay. you know, you have 
very exp expensive Bluetooth systems where everybody has to have a tag on them. Right. And that's <laughs> for like, you know, it's, it's, it's for like, you know, say babies and, and patients at hospitals. Right. Well, that, that's like a high value enough use case where you can justify that infrastructure spend. Right. But to like get it wide, widely adopted, it's been challenging. And so, you know, I'll, I'll kind of come back to it. What I recognize, I, I thought recognized Butler was the possibility to really have a lot more scalability in terms of a fundamental technology. So Butler was spun out of the MIT Media Lab in 2019 by Hong Hao Deng and Jianni Zhang. They were, they were doing research out of Kent Larson City Science Group and really doing research in home automation and, and, and sort of similar and use cases like having the home be responsive to its individuals. To cut a long story short, they couldn't find a sensor out of the box that did what they needed to do for these projects. So sensing humans and differentiating between humans and animals and, you know, just, just things like that. And so, which didn't involve some significant compromise, whether it was on cost or privacy or, or ease. And so hmm. they leveraged research that had been done um, at MIT to really create this uh, a sensor that leverages thermal. So it's, a, it's, it's thermal sensing fundamentally. And so it's looking at the, you know, essentially pixels of heat in the environment. And then a lot of the secret sauce is actually the, the, the algorithms and the machine learning that happens to extract intelligence out of that. So really yeah. fundamentally, what we're doing is we're looking at pixels of heat and we're extracting that and saying, that is a human and this is how they're moving. And once you have that nail, that's like the core, like the primitive, then with context on top of that, you can provide other types of value or other types of applications. Right. Yeah. And so, so that's like, and, and the other, the other, the other kind of breakthrough that the, that the, that the team achieved was to be able to make these sensors and you can see them in my hand here to make them battery operated or wireless. Ironically, we'll actually be coming out with a, a wired version later this year due to some, you know, with, with some of our customers requesting it. But this thing, wireless, you know, lasts, you know, a year to two years, depending on kind of how often you run it. And so as a result, you can pop it up above a door on a ceiling in, in, in seconds or minutes. Yeah. Um, we just did an install last week where we have these magnetic mounts and it just like snaps right in to a ceiling grid, to a duct or a pipe, and you're done. Um, yeah. And so you don't have to have all kinds of wiring, especially for retrofits. That's been a big issue. And so that was the other part of the sort of scalability that was remarkable was just having a system like that, that will we'll be able to, you know, operate uh, wirelessly while also operating in real time. So, you know, you're not doing a poll every 15 minutes or something like that just to keep the battery life. Yeah. For those of you that are just only on audio, Rags was holding up one of these sensors and they're about the size of your palm, basically. Right. And this, they're really small. I like, like, like a, a small, a small computer mouse. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just for, for the visual, for those of you that are in the car or on the subway or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, proceed. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, we, I ended up doing some due diligence with, into Butler and helped uh, them pull a seed round together with some VCs that either I'm affiliated with or I knew. And, uh, and then soon thereafter, ended up joining full time. So this is my day job. This is what I sort of think about at night. And, 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 and it's been great since we, you know, it's a it's a horizontal technology, right? Occupancy sensing can can apply to a bunch of different environments, and so we went on this discovery journey last spring and, and into the summer as to like which market to really you know kind of focus on first. We looked at retail and higher education and a bunch of different you know and manufacturing logistics, and and we really got conviction that the workplace and buildings and commercial buildings, you know, commercial real estate was the first place to really, you know, where, where, you know, we could see a lot of demand and, and product market fit. And so that's how we connected. And, and it's been, it's been great ever since we, you know, starting to work with, you know, sort of three major uh, players in that value chain. So we work with occupiers, so, you know, tenants of, of large real estate portfolios that are looking to understand how their space is used. We're working with landlords and property owners that, again, trying to understand how the buildings are operating with occupancy being one piece of it. We're not, we're not certainly providing the whole piece. And then thirdly, third parties that are, you know, you might call them like a data layer on top, aggregating data and providing value add on top of that. So 
Last week, we announced a partnership with Georgia Pacific who are using our occupancy data into their Colo smart restroom monitoring system hmm. to make it smarter, essentially. Okay. And so you know, that's, 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 you know, that's overall kind of, you know, who we are, you know, our mission is to make the built environment people aware, you know, it's crazy that we, there's all this, this capital stock and these buildings, and they're not really responsive to the, 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 the inhabitants inside. And that's like our vision overall is, is, is to make that is to make the buildings a lot more responsive. Hey guys, just another quick note from our sponsor, Nexus Labs, and then we'll get back to the show. This episode is brought to you by Nexus Foundations, our introductory course on the smart buildings industry. If you're new to the industry, this course is for you. If you're an industry vet but want to understand how technology is changing things, this course is also for you. The alumni are raving about the content, which they say pulls it all together. And they also loved getting to meet the other students on the weekly Zoom calls in the private chat room. You can find out more about the course at courses.nexuslabs.online. All right, back to the interview. Cool. Yeah, I have some questions about the like the product and the company. Maybe we could just start by like walking up the stack. So you talked about sensors, heatic, is that how you pronounce it? Heatic. 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 Okay. Heatic yeah. sensors. Yep. Basically yep. sensing the environment for body heat, right? Can you talk about how that sensor differs from other occupancy sensors or counters on the market? Yeah, sure. So Besides the wireless and the really easy to deploy piece of it. Sure. Yeah. So the, 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 the most widely deployed occupancy and kind of in a way spatial analytics sensor out there is the, you know, old school PIR sensor, right? Yeah. I have a bunch of them in my house for like a security system and you see them everywhere, right. To open, you know, to turn lights on and off, then you got to do that dance to, to turn them back on. Right. When you, when you're sitting mm-hmm. still, but that just last year, it was, it was the 40th anniversary of when that technology was first invented, right? So it's, it's, it's super widely deployed. And so, and in a number of different applications, and yet it's this, as someone said, the world is tired of PIR, right? There, there, it's, 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 there's, there's not much intelligence. It's just a one or a zero. It can't tell how many people are there, where they're moving, it can't differentiate between, say, a person and an animal or w- whatever. There's, there's just, it's just, it's just a very, it's sort of a, a dumb device, but it, it, it is, it has been very widely deployed, right? So our vision really is to be that next generation type of PIR type of sensor, right? To provide intelligence and therefore make the built environment people aware. So you, you ask sort of like what we capture. So we're capturing fundamentally. You know, we're understanding occupancy. We're also able to understand pose. So is someone standing up or sitting down or lying down and even sort of surface temperature as well. And when you start okay. combining those things, there are all kinds of applications that are possible either for ourselves or for our partners. And uh, so, you know, one, one, I would say, you know, one other thing to call out is fundamentally ours is a, is a horizontal vision. So we're not, we're not going up the stack and planning to build visitor management systems and IWMSs and space management, you know, or, or things like that. We're rather looking to partner with the Georgia Pacifics, with the maps of, and, and DLR groups of the world that'll pull our data in and have that, you know, end user application for whether it's, you know, smart cleaning or smart HVAC or, or you know, whatever the, the, the capabilities are. But, you know, in terms of differentiation, so Privacy is core to what we do. We're not physically capable of capturing PII. So we're not, you know, it's like, you know, so, so that's like one thing that's core. Second is, you know, we're from a, a kind of, you know, it's like one system that can cover the major use cases in a building. What I mean by that is you've got threshold sensors that count ins and outs, you know, across a threshold. And those tend to be LIDAR based or camera based. Those tend to also almost invariably be wired systems. We can do that whether it's wired or wireless with our heat sensor. Second is you've got sensors that'll do kind of open areas or or room level type of sensing, right? Occupancy sensing. And again, today the the kind of state of the art quote unquote is camera based systems which can be expensive to wire up and certainly by rooms whereas you know we're able to ca- you know capture room level occupancy and open area occupancy like kitchens and things like that and then the third category in buildings is 
is just desks where you'd have the traditional under the desk PIR sensor. And so we can cover that use case as well. So you, you have a sensor above a bunch of, you know, bank of desks uh, and can ca and capture that way. So with us, you're not mixing and matching. It's just the same sensing system that does those different use cases. And then that data gets expressed both through a simple dashboard we have for like basic occupancy and room utilization that we provide our end users. And then also through our API, and you know, we're really very much an API first company to, you know, provide API, you know, to, to our, our partners, right. That'll pull it into their own applications. Got it. I'd love to, you probably would guess this, but I really love to zero in on the API first aspect because that's a rare thing. So if I've done sort of a analysis of the occupancy sensing market, looking at all the different startups that it's definitely the minority of companies that have chosen to be API first. Why, why did you guys decide to go, go that route? Our mission is to make the built environment people aware, right? Our vision is to replace PIR, right? That by definition is like a horizontal, it's like a horizontal vision, right? And, and by definition, you can't have applications to all those different types of end users mm -hmm. to achieve that vi vision and mission, right? You're going to have to partner with people that can actually take that data and insights that you provide and, and then package that up and sell that into the end user, right? Yeah. Given the vision and the mission, it's something where we've, you know, we've really, yeah, come to terms with like, look, we don't want to build yet another desk booking system. Like that's not how we can add value to the world, right? We can add value by providing great, accurate, real-time, anonymous occupancy data at a fraction, oftentimes it's an order of magnitude lower cost than what's out there today. And that's also a big reason that, that our customers are choosing us. And that's what really motivates us is because we've, we've heard so much that people want this data and they've tried pilots of other types of systems, but it's just been very expensive and they, mm -hmm. they have a hard time justifying, the, you know, scaling it out and rolling it out. And like PIR, we just want to be like that to go away. Just like, like this should be this should be, you know, accessible and you should be able to have a business case that can support getting access to occupancy data that's, that's you know, accurate and, and insightful. And so, yeah, that, that means API first. That means, like I said, you know, we have people mixing us with IAQ data. We have people mixing us with other sources of potentially occupancy data like badge. We have folks using us for informing building controls and, and HVAC. We're actually working with a major HVAC uh, OEM right now in that regard. So, and, and, we're, and we always say, we, we take pains to say, you can have our dashboard. It's web-based, it's, it's slick, it's nice, but we do not, like our, our strategy is to not be the single pane of glass. Like we don't have to be that single pane of glass. And we were talking about this earlier, sort of on the sidebar, but I found as a newbie to this, to this space, that that layer is a lot more crowded. Like you've got yeah. idea WMSs that are moving into like desk and, 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 and visitor booking and vice versa and the space management companies. And, you know, everybody sort of has a different angle in, but fundamental and tenant experience. And so, and, but fundamentally you still need occupancy data to um, drive a lot of those use cases. And that's where we, you know, we sit and we see ourselves sitting. Yeah. And, and, our members know that I wrote about this last fall and in the lens that which we'll put a link to the, in the show notes for, for them if they want to revisit this. But the value of occupancy data is so much bigger than you can write, than you can create an application for, right? It, it far exceeds the value of one application, one use case. And so it's almost like gets in the way if, and this is why I wanted to talk to you about this, it gets in the way if you're trying to lock lock it down for one use case and you're not yeah. Yeah. fully focused on the API and providing it to whoever needs needs that yeah. data. Yeah, I mean, we have three buckets of value proposition or use cases that this, you know, that we, we sort of bucketed in three, right? The first is like workplace planning and, you know, and, and kind of, you know, asset management, if you will, right? And whether you're an owner or an occupier, right? It's like, you know, owners like, how's my building performing or how, what's the traffic like in the suites and things like that. Right. The mm -hmm. occupiers it's, you know, answering real estate questions, you know, uh, questions with data driven decisions, like 
should I extend this lease or not? Or should I reposition this space to be more collaborative? And a bit of an aside, James, is like the workplace is a product, like the building is a product. And it's like, again, as a newbie, the lack of instrumentation in these products has been pretty surprising to me, right? Coming yeah. into this, right? Like you would never launch a website, like an e-commerce website without instrumenting it to know how it's being used, right? And yeah. then make decisions on that. But yet, you know, you sort of had this in, with a lot of the, the building stock out there. It's like, it, it's a product. It's got a value proposition. It's got customers. It's got competition or substitutes. And I think like, and actually some of the more forward thinking workplace people we work with, they're thinking about it that way. So they're starting to like think about cohort analysis and retention rates and things like that for their product. Yeah. Quite, like quite right. Like they should, and then they should report out on that, you know, based on that. So anyway, kind of zooming back out, there's the workplace and, 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 and planning a bucket. The second bucket is, is employ your tenant experience. Right. And, you know, you talked a bit about that actually, I think in last week's podcast that you had with Joe. And again, this is like, it can be from wayfinding to hoteling and bookings and all of that. And so, you know, part of our value proposition is it's passively collected, right? So no surveys, no having to like behavior change of like checking in or QR codes. It's just like you're in a room, it's occupied. It shows us up as occupied in an app or in the screen, right? It's 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 just your presence, right? And then the and then the third bucket is around facility management and building operations, right? So that's like your smart cleaning, your smart HVAC, and, and other types of applications around that. And so to your point, occupancy data we see cut across those three categories, and we're working with companies and third parties in those areas um, that can take this data, and you know we can jointly create value. Fascinating. And, and I think it's also like, it's not just that it can provide data to all of those different use cases. It's that you can also solve for the overlaps between them. Like when we think about indoor air quality and energy, like things like that, it, it's yeah. kind of at the intersection of all of them as well, which is fascinating. It's true. Yeah. And I think it's, it's still early days in that, right? I, I haven't seen, but I think that's like yeah. absolutely the case. Like we were talking about to someone about, Hey, could you combine? Yeah. Kind of occupancy and air quality and what other things can you combine? Right. So IE, like, can you look at, did meetings last shorter because like it was such stale air or something, right. That, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, or, or like the use of meeting rooms, right? Because, and you can correlate that to both occupancy and the air quality of that, right? And then can, yeah. are those then indications or proxies for productivity or employee experience or things like that? I think we're very, in the very early innings of those kinds of data, but, but it's exciting to think about what could be done with those. And, and not to mention, you know, looking at other data sources, like you know, room bookings or Zoom bookings and, and, and seeing how they, you know, how they potentially correlate. Fascinating. Yeah. I'd love to hear if you can share what you can share on like what, what traction you guys have had so far, you know, what partners, like what types of building owners and why are they sort of picking, picking Butler? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, like I said, we're working with companies. So, you know, we've got, again, like three buckets of companies uh, that our customers or partners. Uh, so the first is tenants and, and, you know, occupiers, right. That are trying to understand how their space is being used. And, and that can be from very simple reporting purposes all the way to like space planning purposes. So we're working with a subsidiary of general dynamics for like, just like base building, you know, and, and suite occupancy. We're working with uh, slalom, which is a consulting firm, you know, to help them understand how their innovation space is being used. So, and, and then some, household names that I can't share yet, but, but some like large tech companies, tech companies by definition, you know, sort of in, by nature, they're very data hungry. So of course they're going to like be very open to adopting these things, but we've also found a lot of interest in financial services and uh, telco as well. They've just got large footprints uh, yeah. where again, you know, a, a five figure investment in, in sensing can drive seven, eight figure decisions of real estate and it's sort of a no brainer for them. The second bucket is, is on the, is, is landlords. And what we found there is there's, there's like a, a couple of different use cases that they mostly, they mostly care about. The first is like just base sort of, it's like you've written about it before, James, like building analytics, right? 
So mm -hmm. that could be for just understanding how the product is being used and especially using that for pricing or for potentially anticipating renewals, right? So again, yeah. like we, you know, we had, there's one owner where they, the fact that they had a, they had a tenant that was going to not renew their lease, but they actually pointed to occupancy data saying, look, actually people have been coming in. You may not know this, but people have been coming in. Right. So there's just like that base understanding of, of using that data for, for pricing and for, you know, for like, just when should you have the renewal conversation or those kinds of things. The second is, is really sort of amenity usage and understanding like kind of what amenities are being used when, and then potentially flashing that or providing that in a tenant experience app. So there's right. one owner um, in the DC metro area that, that we're looking to work with, you know, that wants, that's like very, that's very much part of their use cases is amenity usage and both historically and in real time for a better tenant experience. And then I'd say like, there's, there's a, there's, there's sort of like a third motivation, which is this pandemic is, you know, again, it's sort of like a, a bit of a bifurcation where the, the, the properties that are seen as most tech forward, there's sort of this halo effect for them, right? They can differentiate their product in the market and, and can use that to drive, you know, higher occupancy rates and lease ups for themselves. And so just like the fact that they're investing in, you know, sort of these types of sensor systems and IAQ, part of that story, right, of being tech yeah. forward. And, and you know, like, that's a company that that's a space that I want to, I want to be in, right? I just, I know that landlord has the right frame of mind. And, and so that's sort of how they think as well. And then the third bucket, like, you know, as I mentioned, you know, folks like Georgia Pacific, DLR group, prescriptive data, they're using, you know, real time occupancy data, to make better decisions for their customers, right? Whether it's like alerting custodial staff or activity or traffic-based cleaning to making decisions on ventilation or, you know, energy and, and HVAC, right? And, you know, based on this data, right? And I remember um, the someone who's been on your podcast, Jim Whalen, he once told me that it's always stuck. And I was like early on in the space and he was very kind to spend some time with me to educate me, but he said, there's only two independent variables in kind of building operations, right? And you you know this, I'm sort of, you know, but but it's the weather and it's occupancy, right? Everything yeah. else is like dependent on that. And that's always stuck with me. It's like you need occupancy, you need you need occupancy. It doesn't yeah. have to be our sensor, by the way. It can be mixed and matched with others, right? But you just mm -hmm. need that and you need it accurate enough to be able to make good decisions. Love it. Love it. Any, any other things to leave us with as you guys kind of think about the future of, of Butler? I would just encourage people to think about the office or the workplace as a product. And I think there's, and you've written about this again in, in the building that goes to the building, but there's like, I think a new set of metrics and then analytics that I think need to be defined by the in industry that need to emerge from the industry. Because in like the workplace setting, it was sort of like the old school because I asked some people, like, how do you report out? And, and it, it's either really coarse, like number of batch swipes, or it's like people per square foot, or it's just, it's very antiquated, mm -hmm. primitive metrics, right? Right. And, 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 and actually, like, instead, what if you could say, you know, the office, this workplace generated X number of collisions this past week in terms of collaboration. By the way, we tied that back to, these programming that we, this programming that we ran during the week. Right. And so as a result, let's actually do more of this or, you know, <laughs> like, I, I think it's just like, it's, it's a new set of metrics that need to emerge to really, frankly, tell the story better and understand the value proposition of the office. Because before it was just like, it was, it was opt out. Like you, you were just expected at your desk. Right. And you had to have a good reason to like not be at work. Right. <laughs> right. At the office, right. Now it's like for, for most companies, it's opt in. Like you got to like, like, and that's why I like to think like a product manager. It's like, what is the value proposition of your product and how are you measuring that? And what are the changes you're making and how are you measuring that? Right. The, yeah. the, those changes. And so that's just like the one, I guess, like, that's what I would leave, leave, uh, leave you with and in, in, in your audience with. Cool. And so collisions would be like, zero collisions would be like, I go to the office and I sit in my cube and I don't talk to anyone and then I go home. And then you could basically look at the sensor data and say, 
well, actually this person was getting coffee and they ran into this other person and they talked for two minutes and then they moved on, right? So be, yeah. being able to quantify that sort of interaction. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Like quantify interactions, quantify focus time. Cause like, if you're just like at your desk, okay, that's focus time. Okay. Like let's understand that. Should we have more of those? And then, you know, you can mix that with other data sets, right? Whether it's energy, whether it's inter- air quality, whether it's, you know, surveys, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot there that you can do once you have access to the data. Right. And then you can start, you know, making more data driven decisions. And, and again, like, I think helping helping people understand the value of this, right? I've been in the sweet C-suite at, at you know, these software businesses where real estate was kind of seen as a cost center, right? You just sort yeah. of had to have it. It was a cost center, right? Well, I actually think like real estate in the workplace can become a profit center. If you can actually articulate like what it does for productivity, for collaboration, for engagement with visitors and, and, and so on. And, and so far it's like been very anecdotal, right? Oh, like, you know, it's a really nice feel when we walk into the office or, you know, that we had a great demo and there were a lot, or there was a lot of people at, at the like free pizza day. Right. But it's, a, it's very like anecdotal or you sort of like the old clipboards and clickers to yeah. understand how people are using it. And I just think that's going to change. And, and so, you know, that, that will require systems of intelligence to, you know, understand what's happening and then provide that out. And we're hoping to be one of those. Awesome. You ready for carve outs? So I've been, I was telling you before we hit record, we used to do two truths and a lie. And then at the, at the end of every year, the beginning of every year, I like to ask people what they're looking forward to. Well, now we're like all the way into 2022. And so we need a new end of the show, casual thing to end with. And so we're going to do carve outs. And I got this from the Acquired podcast, which I've been totally binging on lately. And I love their carve outs at the end. Mine is, and these are basically just things that you think the audience should know about and then mostly not from smart buildings so just things that you would tell a friend hey you should listen to this or you should watch this or whatever so mine's will smith's autobiography it's called will and i would definitely listen to the audiobook it's about 16 or 17 hours so he like goes back to his birth and like tells all these stories and so if you're a 90s kid like me and grew up with the you know the fresh prince of bel-air reruns on on the tv this is a great look at you know just an icon in in our culture. And he tells all these amazing stories and he he gives it from like a personal development standpoint. So he's he's like, here's what I learned. And then he kind of zooms out and like gives the lesson as well. So it's it's fun. It's fun from a he's the narrator and he's a great narrator standpoint, but it's also fun from like, oh, that lesson sort of applies to my life as well. So I'd recommend that for everyone. Yeah. Awesome. Nice. I'll have to check that out. I like Will Smith. He's a, he's a, he's a Philly guy uh, like me. So yeah. So my, mine would be, I recently finished James Clear's Atomic Habits and cool. I'd heard about it and I finally picked it up. And, you know, for those not familiar, it, his notion is just by small changes of habit, not big ones. And he has like systems of like how to instill the good ones and not, and, 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 you know, not the bad ones, those things compound over time to lead to like big results over time. Right. So if you can just do something 1% better, or if you can start, so, you know, for, for me, one of the, 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 the two of the habits that I've tried to like just do is one, I'm doing a plank every day for two minutes. I read an article. It's like, what happened? Just do that. Just do that. Right. Cause it's just like, it's, it's just, it, it's full body. And, and it's just an amazing thing. If, if all you do for f- of exercise is like two minutes of plank, you're like, you're good. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the second is, is to meditate. And you know, his, it's like have a much more regular meditation practice. Okay. And, and again, I try and, you know, if it's like a minute or two, it's better than zero. You just got to show up. Right. And so I think that I, I'm a big believer in that. I'm just from having read the book. So it's a, it's a quick read and, and I'd recommend it. Yeah. I'd recommend that book too. It was instrumental in helping me figure out how to have a, a writing practice. Like what you just said, I will show up every day. And if I write 10 words, then that is a checked off day of writing essentially. So yeah. Well, love it rags. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Yeah. Pleasure. Thanks James. 
All right, friends, thanks for listening to this episode of the Nexus Podcast. For more episodes like this and to get the weekly Nexus newsletter, which, by the way, readers have said is the best way to stay up to date on the future of the smart buildings industry, please subscribe at nexuslabs.online. You can find the show notes for this conversation there as well. Have a great day.